Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Saunders, and I'm the Cine Youth Festival Director. Um, I'm so glad to have everyone here for the 16th Cine Youth Festival being held virtually. And this is the Q&A for the Lights, Camera, Lockdown program, which is a program of films that were made um, within the last year under pandemic circumstances. And we've got uh, quite a variety here with us today. Um, so as we get started, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, have each of you sort of introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your film. Um, so Bridget, you could go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Bridget Johnson, and my music video is called Only Love, and it's by a Chicago R&B artist called Gemtree. It's a short, cute little music video about two female skateboarders who meet at Logan Skate Park. If you're from Chicago, it's a very underground skate park, and they meet and they start to fall in love regardless of their friends making fun of them, and they film each other on a VHS camera throughout the city. And that's, it's just a cute little short music video. Sure, it, it absolutely is. Um, and Tessa, you could introduce yourself. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Tessa and my film is This is a Completely Normal Home Movie, uh, which is a little piece that I made from the very depths of the original quarantine, the original lockdown back in May of 2020. So it's, you know, a little bit experimental, just me and my laptop. Yep. And then Claire, you can introduce yourself. And hi, I'm Claire, and I made a short documentary called Exposure, and it follows a COVID ICU nurse throughout a day in what um, life has been for her, like working during this pandemic. Great. So, you know, I guess I, before we get into the specifics for each film, um, naturally something I'm wondering about and a lot of people are wondering about was just the challenges that were involved in creating work during the pandemic um, and how that might have changed your creative process just in general. Um, so I was wondering, you know, if each of you could speak a little bit about that. So, you know, Bridget, um, your film, it, of course, it naturally brings it all to the attention with everyone wearing masks, but at the same time, it's not like, they're not talking about the pandemic. I mean, of course it's nonverbal, it's a music video, but yeah, if you could talk about, you know, creating a music video during a pandemic, just the production and challenges involved with that. I think one of the main challenges was just keeping everyone safe and especially because Claire and I would be kissing and making sure we were both tested and everyone on set was tested and then staying six feet away. But one struggle was for the actors to show their face expressions, facial expressions, and they were wearing masks. So we had to kind of show more with gestures and physical gestures and to show that my friends were making fun of us and so that was one of the main struggles but we didn't really have too many struggles filming like our location was outside so we didn't have to worry about like covid safe safety like indoors but yeah it went pretty smoothly yeah, I mean, and I think, you know, to speak a little about that challenge with not being able to show the facial expressions, there's almost like a, um, uh, maybe it's a reach, but like a silent film energy to some of those performances, like in the skate park itself, because it's very emotive and physical. Um, and then naturally, since there's no dialogue, like I, I feel like that, you know, that worked really well for, for the film. Um, and I remember one thing I was really struck by was the fact that um, there's so much performance in your eyes, in everyone's eyes in the film, because like the, the mouth is limited. Um, was that something that maybe you had like brought up to them, like try and do more with your eyes or did that just sort of happen naturally? Yes, definitely. Because I think also when you're in love, it's, you could see it in someone's eyes and just like how their face lights up when you're around them. So I think that was like, Claire and I had a conversation, but we were kind of, we didn't really have to act because we were like dating during that time. So it was just keeping everyone's, also like the other actors to remind them to show bigger than what was on screen, kind of like theater, like you were saying with the silent film. So just making sure that everyone was on the same page with that. Right. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it seems that's the case. You know, there is like a cohesion there. 
Um, Tessa, I guess, you know, so yours is all at home. So I guess there weren't, the, the safety challenges weren't necessarily something that was coming up, but I guess, you know, your your work that you've had at Cine Youth in the past, right? The um, There's been lots of like physical media, like films made in a scanner. And I guess, you know, when the, with the pandemic and choosing to, to make a project, like what were some of the creative challenges involved with that? Yeah, yeah, so I didn't have to deal with any of the safety things, but um, yeah, I guess one of the bigger challenges which turned into motivation was that like I hadn't made anything for basically about a year by the time I made uh, this piece. Um, so the last film that I made actually is also in Sydney Youth. Uh, it's in the uh, new outlook LGBTQ plus one. And that was the final film um, of my film program that I was in in high school, which is I would say in a lot of ways that film is like very entirely opposite to this one. And that like, I'd worked so hard to get all of the like gear. I was working with actors. It was like a narrative. Um, I, it was very much not me on screen. Also, I guess the one I had in um, Cine Youth in 2019 with Made in the Scanner was technically me, but this is the first film that I've made where I'm like in it. Um, and so part of the challenge was I'd felt that I was in a little bit of a creative drought um, or just I'd started my first year of university and I kind of had the like, oh, I'm not in, I wasn't in, a, I'm currently not in a film program anymore. Um, so I had a little bit of a fear that I wouldn't be able to get it back, <laughs> which is not really real, um, but I felt it anyway. Uh, and so I had a lot of high hopes when quarantine started to like be creative and like write. It wasn't necessarily, I wasn't really thinking about a film per se. And then when I did this piece, um, it was very, very um, out of the blue. I, I literally was like sitting in my kitchen um, and I looked over at these flowers that my mom had started buying, um, ordering flowers every week um, to be delivered to our house. Um, and I'd come home from university and she was kind of like making this effort to like, I don't know, make things more beautiful and kind of like beautify the mundane a bit. Um, and then I was having lots of feelings about that at that time. But the whole like the whole piece kind of came to me like at once, um, which doesn't usually happen. So in that way, it was a very uh, strangely smooth project um, because I knew exactly what I was going to do. It really required no equipment except for me and photo booth. Um, and I edited it in about like 24 hours. And then um, that was it. So, yeah, so pretty smooth, but it was it was a good um, and difficult like foray again into filmmaking after a little bit of a break. And you know, you you made that comment about um, your mother's flowers, um, and it that, that reminds me of the moment in the film where you'd say, you know, like look at all these flowers; they're all so beautiful, and surround yourself with the virtual flowers. Um, and yeah, there were just so many moments in the film that. Uh, really registered uh, like intensely with me when I watched it. I feel like I had like a strong emotional reaction. Um, and that was one of them because, yeah, I don't know, it, it felt very relatable in the sense that we're online, we're like surrounding ourselves with these images, these virtual things. Um, I mean, it is nice to hear that your mother's flowers were real, but it's also, you know, in the film, like that's how it feels, right? It's this yeah. like, we're surrounding ourselves with things to, to, to feel something almost. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily a question, but maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Like the idea of, the, the comfort zone of like creating a virtual space for your own self. Yeah, and that, yeah, that totally was where it came from for me. Cause I think that um, at, at that time, so yeah, it was a bit a month into the pandemic and, or into like when we were in lockdown. Um, and I mean, people were, we were, everyone was obsessed with documentation um, as I think that we still are in a way. Um, and I don't, that, that's not a bad thing at all, but it was a side of like, let me document what's going on. Like, let me uh, move into this creative thing. And then also let me continue to figure out ways to like present myself online and build this world online and like feel like I can, um, feel like I'm in a space that I'm not actually in. Um, and so for me, a lot of what I was exploring in this piece um, was not just like, my mom's flowers but like yeah so like how am i like where where are my hopes lying right now um and where where am i looking and we were all looking to screens we were looking to ourselves um 
and yeah, I kind of wanted to like explore that in a genuine way and also kind of like make fun of it a little bit. Like I didn't, uh, even the whole like aesthetic of like, this is a home movie, blah, blah, blah. Like I'm not actually that interesting. Um, so part of it is also about that. Like it's not, it's not supposed to be very interesting. It's supposed to be a little bit like self-serious in um, a way that's making fun of itself. But yeah, like the, all of those I think are still, even though they're a little, a little bit much sometimes, they're really, really genuine, like genuine things that we do, create these worlds for ourselves, um, try to change ourselves, our environment. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I will only just like slightly disagree. I do think your personality is quite interesting. And I think Thank that you. that's <laughs> so clear in the film, you know, and that that's, you know, there is something beautiful about banality. There can be, you know, yeah. if you bring like your, your whole self to it. Um, well, now, so Claire, to talk a little bit about just general challenges involved with a pandemic film, right? Yours, I mean, you were on the front lines. Uh, you were there in the hospital with the nurse. So I wonder if you could talk about just that production process. Yeah, so when I originally approached uh, Deanna, who was the nurse, um, I kind of had a plan to do this documentary on her without being in the hospital. Cause just in my mind, I was like, there's no way I'll be able to, you know, even get into the hospital. So I was like, I can do it with some, you know, symbolic imagery and just kind of work a story and visuals around her story. And then we had our first call and then she's like, okay, let me like do some emails and see if I can get you in. And honestly, Deanna is, a great human. I've known her for a while. She's been a close family friend and honestly acted like a producer on this. She sent all those emails and that like a week later, she's like, okay, we have approval to come into the hospital and film here, are like the forms. And she just made it happen so easily. The hospital, the staff at Sharp Memorial in San Diego were um, incredibly amazing to work with and so willing to let me come in and just capture a bit of their story and the challenges that they've had to deal with. Um, so yeah, what I thought was gonna be a very complicated process ended up being pretty um, a pretty smooth experience to get to shoot in the hospital. Um, and yeah, I guess challenges were that uh, obviously it was, very, it was only me on crew um, and I wanted a pretty quick turnaround because it's very like, it was a very like timely piece. I wanted it to be for March for that period of time because COVID changes like day to day, week to week, it's always changing, evolving. So it was a very specific piece, piece to March, 2021 and how that looked for nurses were, um, it was at the one year mark of the pandemic. And that's what I was trying to release it on to kind of show how this whole year had affected the nursing community. Um, so yeah, just working alone on this and making sure I had everything, but honestly, overall, it was pretty smooth, so. That was good. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I definitely think, right, like that makes sense that it was just you there because, and then naturally, one thing I loved so much about the film was that it was, um, you know, it was all process footage and then we just had the voiceover playing over it. So I can understand mm -hmm. the practicality of that as well. Just like not needing a, a sound person in mm -hmm. the hospital with you. Um, yeah. I also like that you touched on the fact that, so you've know, the nurse was a family friend that, so you've known her and she, worked as a mm -hmm. sort of a producer on the film. Um, yeah. <laughs> but maybe you, I'm curious about how you approached her about, you know, why you thought uh, it was worthwhile, like making a film about it and maybe if she had any hesitancies um, about things like that being captured on film. I'm just curious how that conversation went. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like I said, I've known Deanna since I was probably eight. Her younger sister was my childhood best friend. So we've been very close um, and so I've known she, you know, was in nursing and recently it was, I think around December, she had done this podcast, um, just kind of talking about how nurse, the nursing community had changed within the past year, which I listened to. And it was just so interesting because obviously I knew it must have had changed, but just hearing more like specific things, like in the film, you see they use like binoculars now to read numbers um, on like the monitors in the rooms to limit, you know, going in and being exposed. Um, so just so many little things like that and different innovations they had to do like technically and also mentally they've had to, you know, there's, they've gone through so much. So I listened to that and 
during the pandemic, it was very, I think for artists and creatives, we've been very like on pause, you know, we couldn't create as much as usual. And I had been wanting to do something and I listened to that and was just very inspired by her story. So um, I texted her, I was like, would you possibly be interested? And she was very open from the beginning. And then we, you know, did a few calls and I kind of told her the vision I had for it. And um, what she kind of wanted to tell and her story she wanted to um, give in the film. I think something that, you know, was kind of a challenge that she was kind of worried of, you know, telling her story, but she um, was worried that, oh, what if like other nurses don't feel the same way and wanted to speak for all nurses. But I think we really, I was like, this is your story and you have every right to tell what you want to tell and what you want to say. And so, yeah, and then it turned out like this. So yeah, she was great to work with and super open to whatever ideas I had. I mean, and I think it really helps that it's a it's a focus on a specific nurse and her story, um, mm -hmm. because that's what I found so touching about it was just like that very like specific personal element yeah. um, and hearing her describe her day to day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, we've got some questions from the audience and I wanted to turn back to Bridget. Um, so someone asks, and this is something I was wondering was, you know, what drew you to Gem Tree's music and how did you find the song? Um, and yeah, if you could talk a little bit about that process of like, have you, were you in contact with them before the film or yeah, just finding the music? Funny story, I was actually just on SoundCloud, like just listening to music. And then one day I just discovered her music and this one song, Only Love, kind of fit with like what I was going through in my life. And so I was like, I would love to make a music video with her song and I was in a music video class at DePaul where I go to school and so it was perfect timing and I just emailed Gem Tree's management and then I got in contact with her and we had a call on the phone and then I got permission to use her song. So it was kind of just fate that it all worked out and the timing was perfect. And I the film or the music video will be released on her YouTube channel soon. So I'm looking really forward to that too. I'm still muted. That's great. That, that, that's fantastic that it'll be released on, on her channel. Um, there's, oh, it looks like Emilio is ready. Um, he's joining the stream. I'll bring him in. Can you, uh, can you see us and hear us, Emilio? Yeah, I can see and hear you guys. How's it going? Awesome. Great to see you. Um, Emilio is the, the director of Fragments of Gage, um, which is the short documentary about um, also a, about a, a nurse and someone who works um, in a, at a bakery. Um, Emilio, one thing we were all talking about, and then I'll sort of, you know, address you for this is, is we were talking about the challenges involved with just making a film during a pandemic um, and how that changed your production process. Um, so yeah, if you could talk a little bit about just, you know, the challenges involved, you know, being on location, you know, right, right in it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was, so what we were initially planning to do with this was actually do a couple of, of uh, local vendors and local businesses in the community, in the Gage Park community. However, there was, because Gage Park uh, 60632 and 6639 were like the most affected, I saw that firsthand, you know, I saw, I would reach out to like florists and other vendors and they currently had COVID or they had family members who were sick. And it was, it, it was just really scary times and it's still really scary times, you know? So it was really difficult. You know, I couldn't really, there was even a point where we considered talking having like a interview through a window because they were sick and I just wanted to talk to them and see how they were feeling. But there was definitely a lot of restrictions and yeah, it, it, it really ended up being just a one man team with me just to reduce the amount of people going in anywhere, you know? Yeah, that's what Claire was was just talking about in terms of like the practicality of like doing documentary production um, during a pandemic mm -hmm. and like sort of the, the one person uh, crew. Um, I wanted to ask you about Emilio, the um, 
the Gage Park Latinx Council, which is, um, I'm just curious about your affiliation with them and how they were involved with the film, because I've just noticed that that's sort of like what this series is related to, and I've seen you posting about it. Um, and yeah, I was wondering if you could just like talk about that organization. Yeah, absolutely, I'd love to. Um, JPLXC, they're a grassroots organization. They were founded by three people who have no backgrounds in nonprofits or anything. They're just community members from Gage Park who've lived there since childhood, you know, and they just care about that neighborhood because it seems like no one else does. If you were to look up Gage Park on the news, it would really just be violent news stories or the alderman being indicted by the FBI and stuff like that. You know, there's no one really looking out for the community in terms of, you know, outreach, mutual aid, programs for kids, art programs, you know, things like that. So that's what they've really initiated. And and they're really, they're really open to any sort of avenue when it comes to giving away, like during the pandemic, they gave away thousands of pounds to food, of food to the community. And, and during last year, they actually brought me on board. They, uh, they call me the resident filmmaker, but you know, that's a big label to hold up to, to um, live up to. But but yeah, they're they're great people. They're my friends. They're they'll they'll be lifelong friends for a long time. And if if anybody wants to look into them, you know, they have a website. They're really good. They're really good people, and they do really amazing work. Awesome, that's great. Um, you know, so after talking about the challenges with everyone, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, aesthetic challenges, or at least like aesthetic choices made throughout production, because all of your films have very distinct visual styles. Um, and I wanted to ask Claire first, um, because your film, while it's, you know, on the front lines, you know, here we are in the hospital, it has an extremely clean look to it. And I was wondering if you could talk about developing that visual style um, while, you know, being in the thick of it. Yeah, I think just like visually and how it was all put together, um, a lot of it came from after we went and shot. So it was just me and my camera um, at the hospital and that was the first day of shooting. And then that night I came home and I just started kind of like editing it together and it all kind of fell into place, kind of like the process of getting there um, and leaving at the end of the day. And so I actually like did an edit of it first and then we went back and did the voiceover interview and filmed a few extra scenes at the beach and at her apartment um at the end in terms of like visually i think i'm always like a fan of just the very um clean and with the depth and everything with the shots um i wanted to feel very like focused and very um you know on deanna she was the focus of this so i think with those kind of choices of um you know, having very shallow depth and always kind of having her in the focus came across through those visuals. Um, but yeah, so I had kind of visually that in mind when I was filming and then um, the edit kind of just all came in the structure after that first day, I, I put it all together and it kind of came naturally from that. Um, to go on a bit about the, the beach as well, um, you know, so while the film does like it, it like looks beautiful throughout, it is, you know, of course, naturally notably quite beautiful when you arrive at the beach and it feels like a very freeing moment um, mm -hmm. because so much of the film is dedicated to the process of like gearing up, putting on masks, putting on gloves, all these other like layers. Um, mm -hmm. And it feels like you can finally breathe again, you know, when you're yeah. out on the beach. And yeah, so it's interesting hearing that that was a decision that was made later. I was maybe you could talk about just like the, the beach photography and how you sort of decided on doing that? Yeah, so beach itself, I had always asked her from the beginning, what are kind of things that you do when you're not at work and that to you um, is a thing you do to kind of like de-stress and, you know, process and after long like shifts as, as a nurse, like what do you do to kind of relax? Um, and so being outdoors in the beach, um, is something that she had mentioned. And so I chose doing the beach because I think it was just a very, you know, it was just so open and a very freeing feeling. Um, the days we went, like the sunset was like beautiful with like the light rays, like it was everything I could have wanted. Um, 
And I think having those scenes kind of in the middle is kind of like a breathing point. Like right before that is a very long shot of, it's a very steady one take, about like a minute and a half, two minutes of her in the room kind of adjusting a patient's position. And the decision to keep that long as it is was because she was telling me they go into these rooms for three hours at a time. They prepare, the whole beginning is for like getting those buckets ready with materials to go into these rooms for three hours so they can get everything done and just limit going in and out, in and out. So I, so yeah, she does that for three hours and I was like, okay, then somebody can sit through this and watch for at least like a minute and a half of just what it really is, you know, and really kind of sit and take it in. Um, so that is what that kind of long shot idea came from. And then we go straight into the beach with, which is I think, a kind of moment to finally kind of okay now I can breathe and then we go back into it yeah there's almost something too about her you know or almost her isolation on the beach that kind of then relates her story this is you know maybe reaching but like it, the way it kind of like reaches all other nurses because you know we're so close we're all we're inside with her um mm -hmm. and we're looking at all these tasks and then it's like the bigger picture it's like this wide open space and she's just you know the sole nurse Mm -hmm. um, and to me, when I saw that moment, it just, you know, it made me think about like the larger scale of everything and like the little mm -hmm. pieces like involved in it. Um, yeah. so it's a very, very touching moment. Mm -hmm. um, there was also, you know, for Tessa, um, I had like a similar reaction to the end of your film. It, uh, the final moments of your film like made me tear up both because it, it was so beautiful, but it also like made me so sad, like thinking about the because I've did, done the exact same thing. You know, it's your final line where you're like, look at this beautiful view, like what more could I want? And you're like slumped, you know? And it's like, that's my, it's like my day-to-day -day life. I mean, the background on my laptop is like a photo from a trip that like a part, my partner and I took a few years ago. And I'm just sitting at home again, day after day. And I'm looking at that. Um, and yeah, and I, I just, how did you find that moment? I, I'm just curious about what led you to that. Yeah. Also, so glad I made you tear up. I love making people cry, uh, <laughs> in like a, in a great, in a good way, not in a horrible way. Also, another side note that one of my favorite um, comments on this film ever is when I posted it on Facebook just for my close friends, and someone said, "I love this. It is beautiful and deeply disturbing," um, which is kind of like the kind of the area that I was going for. Um, in terms of that last moment, um, I really. Yeah, I don't have like a, a like I like I said before, this film was really like it just kind of came out of me, and then I made it. Um, so all the decisions were fully there, but I don't. I'm not super conscious of like how I decided it. But I think for that, it was it was really that like I wanted to trap. Um, I mean, I wanted the entire landscape of the film to just be the the laptop screen, um, and then to have like my own image and like me looking at myself be constant throughout um as the kind of like only character in the space where she lives um and to trap myself within that kind of photo booth uh square um so then the so then the conclusion would be to like what it like yeah the feeling of like looking outside that which is i mean look at this beautiful view and like in a real way like yeah i go outside and like do trips and be a person and like that's what we look forward to beyond ourselves, um, but uh, yeah, in this reality, it's not really, don't really have access to that. Um, and I think that I, um, I considered for a bit, I remember that one important thing for me was having it be one of the preset, um, the preset like Mac screensaver things. Cause I had like a different, it's actually still accidentally my screensaver. Um, I haven't changed it, uh, but I, I had another photo before um, but I really didn't want it to be specific. Um, and even in terms of like all of the stuff um, on the computer itself, other than you can see the photos that I've taken before on photo booth um, that look pretty silly. Um, but I didn't, I didn't really want, I want it to be fairly like fairly generic, fairly um, like obvious that it was, that it's like, it's something that everyone shares all this kind of constructed view um and also also that the image being not like throughout the film i have like birds 
uh, like a sound of birds playing in the background. And I wanted to make sure that the final image was not like a forest or something where you would necessarily see those birds that you're hearing um, to have the kind of uh, contrast. But yeah, so, but, but I, it just felt like that was the natural ending, the, the final X of the tab. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I like that you mentioned that you could see all the other, the old photos at the bottom of the photo booth, because it does feel like this, like, you know, we're in the middle of all of this, here we go again, you know, that it creates like, it almost feels like production design in a way, you know, the way you designed your screen and kept everything yeah. active. Yeah. Um, to, then to speak a bit more about design, Bridget, the, um, the outfits in your film are, you know, they're very colorful, they're very evocative. And I was wondering if you could talk about um, sort of how you created that visual style and also just like the costumes and the look of all the different spots in the film. Yes, so that was a great ex opportunity that we got. We collaborated with a fashion designer who went to the School of the Art Institute. Their name is L. Oliver Designs. And I just reached out to them on Instagram and I loved their outfits. And I thought that skate, like the look of skateboarders, like I'm in the skateboarding community in Chicago. And I was like, this would be so cool to have our actors wear that. It's like the specific look, like the vibrant and there's like those faces. I'm not sure if you saw that in the music video, but with our suit jackets, there's like the logo of L. Oliver and it's very like, intriguing and I really like that. So we chose those. And then one thing Claire and I talked about was at the end, we have matching outfits and that's actually what I'm wearing today. And we found, we went thrifting and we found very similar outfits for the end, this tan color. And we wanted that to showcase that we were kind of, you know, this was a new chapter in both of our lives and kind of like a twin flame relationship kind of thing, like that we're very similar people to showcase that at the end. And then for the look of the film, I wanted to focus on kind of as the camera as a character. And so we wanted to have a VHS camera and we actually got to use one. One of our, our DP, Amy, had a friend who let her borrow the camera. And so that was really cool learning how to, was it Andy Reynoso? I think it might have been. I've also filmed a, a film on his VHS camera. I just, I felt like I, and I knew Amy was involved on your film, so I felt like I had to bring that up. Yeah. No, it was awesome. That was the first time I've ever used VHS, and we had to convert it at my house, and just watching that process, learning that process, and... Um, another thing that was really important for us was interacting with the camera. So in the makeup scene, Claire and I are kind of like filming each other do our makeups. There's a lot of clips that we didn't use due to the time of the, the music track, but that was really important to show our connection through the camera. And we also pass the camera when we're skating. We wanted to, it to feel like you were with us, just watching us kind of fall in love. Yeah, and I mean, there is just so much positive energy in the film in general, which was very refreshing to see with something made under the, like throughout the, the past year. And I was wondering if you could talk about just, you know, creating a, a portrait about positivity and like beauty and love. I think that's just kind of my filmmaking style. I That's how I want to make an impact on the world is through this like positivity. I feel like there's a lot of content that, you know, that is sad. We do need that, like res when you're sad, you kind of watch something that you can connect with. But then also like, I like to focus on the positive in, in life. And I think that's why I tell the kind of films I do because that's what I want to watch too. And so, I think another thing that going speaking of the positivity is queer representation. It's pretty horrible what's out there and it's very sad. A lot of sad LGBT endings. And so I wanted to create something with a positive outlook in in like life. And because a lot of them end with the couple breaking up or someone dying and we wanted to end with like, this is a new start to LGBT plus representation and in music videos, because if you look over the years with 
representation in music videos with lesbians, it's very sexualized. And so we did not want that. We wanted to make it very romantic and cute. Well, it certainly is. So there's definitely a, a success on that end. Um, Emilio, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the thing that struck me most when I was watching your film. Well, there were, there were a few elements specifically, but one that really impressed me was uh, your collection of B-roll um, throughout the film. You use so much of it. You have such a great eye. And I was wondering, um, just your documentary process, like finding all that B-roll to like get coverage for the interviews. Oh, it actually is muted, sorry. Sorry about that. So um, I had never ever made a documentary before prior to this. So it was kind of an interesting process. I didn't know, um, I can't, it was hard to look for help. So I kind of had to wing it. So initially I just started with b-roll of the community which i thought would be you know pretty and because the first thing i had was like i think i should make like a like a title sequence or something so and then from there it kind of i was kind of figuring it out so i decided to edit the interview first the audio clips that i was going to use and then based off of what they're talking about i would go shoot b-roll which is really just me and my camera like going to Mercy Hospital or, you know, catching any type of a B-roll. And like at the bakery, I'm like, can I record you guys baking some bread, you know? So it's really just a one man team. I was out there just uh, recording B-roll and whatever they were talking about, uh, I would just go record it. it. It was pretty rudimentary, but it was a it was a first try. So I'm, uh, I'm happy with it, but I've definitely learned a lot about making a documentary. Yeah, I mean, well, it does have like, it is like a video diary quality to it, uh, mm -hmm. the way that, you know, the fly on the wall, you're capturing all these different things. Um, but so that's interesting that you're saying this is your first, are, I know this is listed as episode one. Are you the one who's planning on like creating the up, the other episodes? I was wondering about the structure of the fragments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, yeah. So the, it's just me. It's just, I'm a one man team. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm working on the second one too. So that's exciting. Uh, if anyone wants to watch it, you know, I'll have it ready by the end of the month, I believe. Oh, great. That's good to know. Where can we watch it? Are these uh, will yeah, this yeah. Be on like a website? So, or? Yeah, yeah. Whenever there's an episode ready, it should be on uh, Gage Park Linux's council's uh, IGTV. So at JPLXC. <laughs> yeah. And his face, so, you know, I was talking about how, you know, Tess's film made me cry and then, you know, Claire's film g g gave me like an entirely different like appreciation for like the individual nurses that are like in the, the pandemic. And your film at one point made me extremely angry. Like I was so fired up at the idea that in the middle of a pandemic, a hospital was being threatened with closure. Um, mm -hmm. It just seemed like so contradictory to me, and it made me think about for-profit hospitals. And I, mm -hmm. you got me all fired up, and you know that's the 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 sign of a great journalist. So I wanted to I wanted to ask a little bit about the state of Mercy Hospital. I think it's maybe been saved, but the name might change. Could you could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So before I talk about that, I actually wanted to say that when I met Chayo, the owner of of Grecia's Bakery on Fifty First. Um, I was just doing, I was just going to ask her about her bakery. And through our conversation, I found out that she also had a job at Mercy Hospital. And I was just like, what? Like, how do you even manage? And, and obviously, while we were doing that, Mercy's fate was in limbo completely. Like, and I'm pretty sure they were leaning towards closing it. It was just a matter of community, you know, backlash. It's like, why would you close the only Southside hospital during a pandemic when it's as, you know, as crazy as it's ever been. So when I was shooting it and we were talking to each other, it was very, it was a scary time. She even said that her bosses and coworkers, like no one knew if they were gonna be working or not, which is um, crazy. And um, so, and then while I was editing it, that's when they said that they're not gonna close it for now, which is uh, for now, I'd, I would emphasize, you know, because, I really don't trust that they their their intentions changed. Yeah, we all know Chicago. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. Well, thanks for the update with that. Um, well, this is. I mean, this has been an absolutely wonderful conversation. Um, we're starting to get to the end of our time here. I did want to add in um, one other audience question that I thought was amusing, and that's for for Tessa. Um, did your neighbors actually complain about your piano playing um, 
you, you, there's a note in your film I remember where you know I say, "Oh, my neighbors were upset that I'm playing the piano all day." Um, is that true? Um, not to my, I was not told to my face. Um, but uh, I, yeah, I don't know. Like, so that whole, um, that whole bit is, yeah, I, it's like I learned to play Moon River on the piano. Um, shut up, my neighbors say, "Heart, heart, heart." So those people on my live stream. Um, but then I stopped playing and like, uh, yeah. And so I was like, I, I, I do, I'm musical, but like not a musician, which is, I think a fine place to be. Um, but my brother also plays piano and he's better than me. Um, and, uh, I hadn't played for like a while. And then, so when I came home at the beginning of the pandemic, I like picked it up again. And I think that piano, when you're like messily playing, it's just like, I was so aware that I was not doing super well um, or just how loud it was. And I usually play and sing. And so, um, yeah, so they did not complain to my face. Um, I don't think that they did complain. I think that also, at, uh, at, especially during that point of lockdown, but at all, like any kind of like little bits of things that you heard of people's lives or what they were doing, I felt like had a lot more weight than if it was the normal world. So maybe they enjoyed it even. Uh, we could, well, we could hope so for sure. I mean, piano music is so lovely. How could you? But I understand the, you know, the trying it out. Um, well, you know, th th this past year was very challenging, and when I was going through all the submissions, I was particularly just like struck by by all of your work, and I just wanted to thank you all for sharing your films with the Cine Youth team. Um, all the programmers were were quite moved by your films, and I think it really gave us all, and I hope it gave all the audience members um, a very a different perspective on the pandemic and just like what exactly the last year meant to a lot of different people. Um, so yeah, so thank you all so much for coming. Um, and I hope everyone who's watching has a chance to catch out other films um, in Cineath this year. So thanks everyone, have a great day. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank you.